Okay, well, uh, you, the, obviously what, what you can see on the screen at the moment is Reliability Workbench. So um, I'm not sure how much conversation you've had with Rachel uh, about it, but um, as you may already know, Reliability Workbench is actually a suite of different reliability analysis software tools. So you can just license the parts that you need. If you only intend to do a fault tree analysis and Markov analysis, then all you would need is a fault tree uh, license. So if you have a license for fault tree, it will include uh, event tree, Markov and viable. So all of these tools are collected together under the fault tree license. The fault tree okay. tool gives you a kind of integrated environment where you can build your fault tree, populate it with failure and repair information, and then analyze that fault tree to determine the probability of failure on demand for a, a system, the frequency of a hazard, uh, and even to determine which events or which failures are contributing the most to problems in your system through the importance and sensitivity analysis. So I'll show you how some of that works here. So let's say, for example, you need to start a new fault tree analysis. If you need to add anything to a project, you can begin in the add menu and you can see there you can add pretty much anything you want to a fault tree uh, from this menu. But you may find it easier once you've adjusted to using the tool uh, to use the toolbar buttons across the top just here. So I can, for example, start a new fault tree by adding a new top gate and that will appear in the tree uh, and I can then edit that uh, anything in a project that you wish to edit you can just double click and that will bring up the properties and you can change the ID enter a description and you'll find that there are notes fields as well where you can add additional information these headings that you can see across the top uh, these are customizable, so you can change those to read whatever you need them to. But I can then expand my fault tree by adding uh, more gates. So I can add a gate, then just left click on the existing gate to add more gates underneath it. Yeah. I can right click and go back to the normal cursor. And then I can simply add events in exactly the same way. I can click to add an event, click where I want those events to appear. So as you're building your fault tree, naturally you might want to change the, uh, the logic of the tree. So you can, uh, for example, double click a gate and change the gate type. So maybe this is and logic instead. I change that that's now an AND gate or I could do something a little more complex I can open this gate maybe and make that a two out of three vote gate so now that's two out of three voting uh, logic and oh. as the tree gets larger and it becomes more difficult to navigate you can of course rescale the tree using the, uh, the Zoom facilities that are available. Um, but you can also break the tree into smaller, more manageable pieces. So I can do that by opening a gate, checking the page box, click OK, and now that gate is on a separate page of the tree. The logic remains the same, but the program has now broken the tree into different sub pages so as my top page with the hazard I can click on gate 2 and see what's under there so I can break the tree into smaller pages and it makes it easier for me to navigate and find the things I'm looking for oh, yeah. once uh, you've built your fault tree uh, naturally then you would want to populate your basic events with failure uh, repair information and maybe other data as well and there are a couple of ways you can approach that in the software um, we use failure models and there are two basic types a local failure model 
and a generic failure model. A local failure model is a set of failure and repair data that is attached exclusively to one event. So in this case, I would open the event and then I would click here to create a new local failure model. I click on that and I, you know, I can choose the type of failure data I want to enter. There's a, a long list of different formats of data depending on the type of failures that you're dealing with. Most yeah. common ones, of course, are the constant failure and repair rate, MTTF, dormant failure, uh, and a fixed probability. Those tend to be the most commonly used models. But you can see there are a wide variety here depending on your requirements. So I might just enter the rate model, uh, enter a failure rate, and as you can see, I can do that in scientific formats if I want. Um, I'm going to enter a repair rate. Click OK, and now that model has been attached to the uh, to the event. So I click OK again, and now you can see there there's a kind of preview of the data that's attached to that event. So that's good if I want to just allocate data to a single event and, and just to that event only, but maybe I want to create failure data which I can share across many events. If I want to do that, I would create a generic failure model. So I can do that in the Add menu, where I can add a failure model, or I can use the toolbar button to do the same thing. And you can see here that the, the, the dialogue is actually pretty much the same as for a local failure model. Um, but I will give that a name, just something very simple. Maybe this time I'll use a, a dormant model. You can see the, uh, the input data changes depending on the model type I choose. I'm going to maybe enter something like that, enter an MTTR and a test interval. Click OK, and then that model appears in the tree. <clears throat> and now I can just drag and drop that failure model onto any event that is appropriate. And one of the really big advantages of this is if I now edit that model, so let's say actually the failure rate is a bit different, that updates all the events that use that model. So for example, if you're modeling a system where there is a particular component that is used throughout, you could just create one model for that component and attach it to all the relevant events. Then later, <clears throat> if you decide, actually, we're going to replace this component with one from a different vendor that has different failure data, you don't have to edit all the events. You just edit the failure model, and all the events are updated automatically. So generic failure models are very useful in that way. Now, um, many systems that you'll come across will... Uh, have to deal with common cause failures. So uh, failures which will um, cause a simultaneous outage of maybe multiple components or systems. Uh, and there, there are different ways you can model that in the software, but perhaps the, the key way to do it is using a common cause failure model. Here you can create a, a model that represents the proportion of component failures that are contributed by common cause failures. So I can create a common cause failure model. And um, let's call that CCF. And then I can enter a beta factor that represents the, the, the proportion of failures of the event that are contributed by common causes. So here, for example, I might say 10% of failures come from, come from common causes. So I add that model. And then I can just attach that to all the events that are uh, affected by it. So now these three events can fail individually, but they might all fail at the same time due to a, a common cause failure, which I've modeled here. Okay. Um, yeah. But there are, there are other ways to approach that as well. One of the things the program lets you do is copy and paste 
gate and event structure. So for example, uh, let's say I've got um, two uh, subsystems, gate one and two, but maybe they share a subsystem in gate three. So I can copy that subsystem and then I can click paste and that will create a second instance of gate three. So gate three is shared between here under gate one and here under gate two. And that little icon is telling me that this gate appears in more than one place in my tree. And I can do that not just with gates, but with basic events as well. Another option you have is um, a feature called paste special. Paste special uh, allows you to basically choose which parts of the tree you're copying will be common causes and which parts will be independent. So I can copy gate four, for example, click gate two and then click paste special. So now I can tell the program, well, maybe gate five and six are not the same. I'm going to have independent events that are the same as five and six, but are independent. So it's like I've got an identical component, but that component is separate from the originals. But maybe I'll say gate event seven is shared. So maybe that's a common component that both subsystems use. So it says here, select primary events you do not wish to rename. And I do not wish to rename event seven. So I click OK. And you can see now I've got gate four and gate five. Here I've got events five and six. And here I've got eight and nine. But here and here I've got event seven. So that's a common cause between these two gates. So the program gives you the power to copy and paste in different ways, depending on whether or not you want to create common cause failures, or you just want to create an event that's identical to the original event, but separate from it. <clears throat> so this uh, gives you an idea of how you might build a fault tree using the software interface. Uh, there are other useful tools here as well to help you with that process. Um, naturally, there are tools for searching your fault tree for gates and events. And there is also a grid facility <clears throat> which allows you to view the contents of your project in the form of database tables. So, for example, if I wish to view my basic events in the grid, I can select the grid and then maybe go to primary events. And there I can see a list of the events in my project. And these can actually be filtered by my selection in the tree. So right now I've selected gate two. And I can see all the events below that level. If I go up to the hazard level, I can now see all the events under that level. I can turn that filter off just with this button here. And now I can just see everything all the time. Or I can turn it back on and then filter by selection. And this grid uh, can be filtered. Uh, you can sort the grid. You can even change the columns that are visible. So these are the currently visible columns in the grid. But I can add more columns from the uh, list on the right. And I can create customized layouts for my grid, which I can reuse with other, pro with other projects as well. So I can have a really customized interface through this grid view. Um, Let's take a look now, maybe it's an example project. Um, so I'll maybe choose that one. So here I have a fairly straightforward fault tree with various layers of structure, different events going down to the root of the tree, a number of different pages. So before I run an analysis, maybe the first thing I might want to do is uh, set up some of the project options. So I can access the project options a couple of ways. I can go to tools, options, and to project. But this icon you can see here is on the toolbar here as well. So that's just a shortcut to the same place. 
I can go to project options. And then um, we'll take a look at just a couple of, uh, of the more important tabs. Uh, we have the calculation tab, which is where you can tell the program the lifetime of the system. You can turn the time dependence on and off. You can even turn common cause failure on and off as well. On the set generation tab, you can set up some of the uh, project um, approximation methods. For example, if you have a very large, complex fault tree, you might be able to improve the analysis speed by placing a probability cutoff on the cut sets. So you're telling the program to discard any cut sets that fall below a certain level of probability. So that speeds up the analysis, but without appreciably um, changing the accuracy of the result. And there are options here too for changing the way the program does the calculation. <clears throat> the, the thing to remember is that if you're in one of these dialogues and you're not sure what the options do, if you select the help button, you'll get the correct page of the help file and you'll get just explanations of what all of these checkboxes do. Most of them you'll probably never have the need to use, but there are inf there is information here to help you understand what all these options are doing. But um, let's run an analysis of the fault tree. So you can see just in the diagram, the program is giving me the results for the gates. Uh, I'm going to take a look at the results summary. And uh, here you can see I can choose the gate I want to look at. This is showing me all the gates for which I have turned on the retain results checkbox. That's telling the program, I don't just want the results for the top gate, I want it for this gate as well. And I can turn that off globally or turn it on globally through the analysis menu. But I'm doing this for all the gates in my tree, so I can see results for all the gates. I can see, of course, probability and frequency. If I wish, I can get information about the MTTF and various other parameters. <clears throat> I can also look at importance. This is a very useful tool because it gives me an idea of which events in my tree are contributing the most to, say, probability or frequency. So here, for example, I can see event EP1 is the biggest contributor to downtime, and I can maybe focus my efforts on improving that part of my system. And of course, we also get the cut sets, the sets of events which, if they fail together, will cause a failure of the top gate. And I get all of those here. Now, as well as viewing the results in the form of just raw numbers, you can also view plots which will show you the results uh, in a graphical format. So, for example, we might want to take a look at a gate time profile. So I need to open the plot options. And I'll tell the program maybe I just want to look at the cooling gate for now. And I want to look maybe at how unreliability changes over time. And then I get a plot showing me the time dependence of the top gate unreliability based on the information that I've provided. I can also look at importance. So I might want to see a plot that shows me which events contribute the most to my system. So this is basically a graphical view of the Fusel Vaselli importance. Uh, and again, I can see a gate, uh, sorry, event EP1 is the big contributor uh, to unavailability. So that is an overview of the fault tree module. Um, now, as we mentioned, if you have a fault tree license, this will also give you access to Markov as well. So let's now take a look at the Markov module um, and see how that can relate back to the fault tree module, how those two modules interact with each other. So I can switch to Markov by going to the module menu and choosing the Markov option. 
Um, in the Markov module, I can build a state transition diagram, which I can analyze and then pass the results back to the fault tree module. So if, for example, part of your system that you wish to model exhibits a kind of strong dependency that can't be handled by a conventional fault tree, you can delegate that part of the analysis to a simple Markov analysis, and then take the results of that and just feed it back into an event in the fault tree. So let's add a Markov model. Um, give that a name. And uh, click OK. And I've now got a Markov model where I can start building. So let's say, for as a simple example, I want to build a Markov model that represents uh, an event which undergoes an imperfect proof test of some kind. So I might create three Markov states for that. So I click Add State. I have one, two, three. Just left click to create the state. Move those around if I want to line them up. And uh, I can edit these. So this first one might represent, you know, that's uh, the working state. So the system is working there and the initial state probability is one. So I'm saying the system is definitely working at the beginning of its life. And I might have another one that represents uh, dormant failure. And uh, this one might be an unavailability state. So if the system is in this state, it is out of service. And it has one more state where maybe it's failed, but it's under repair. Um, so again, this is an unavailability state. But now, at least, we've detected the failure and we've begun repairing it. So now I need to start defining the transitions between those states. So um, I might begin by just adding some transitions. I click to add a transition. I click where I want the transition to start, and I click where I want it to finish, and that creates the transition between those states. I'll create one more here. And uh, I can double click those and specify a uh, transition rate. So that might be failure and repair rate, for example. Now, what I also need to specify here is how I get between dormant failure and the repair state. Under normal operation, I can't do that because it might be a dormant, an undetected failure. So I need to find a way to model an inspection in this Markov model. The way we would do that is to create phases. So I can click on the phase button. I'll add a phase. I'll have one phase, it's just the normal operating phase of the system. So during that phase, I can have normal failure, and if a failure has been detected, I can just have normal repair. So I just have a regular operating state. Maybe I'll say the duration of that is 24 hours. And that's my first uh, phase. Now I'll have another phase. I can have more regular continuous phases if I wish, but in this case, I'm going to create a phase that represents an inspection. And I'm going to make that a discrete transition phase. A discrete transition phase is a phase that occurs instantaneously. There is no time value associated with it. And during that phase, I can make one or more movements between phases with certain probabilities. So I'll make that, that uh, phase, click OK. So now I'm in the operating phase, and I've got these transitions that I've created. If I move to the inspection phase, I can create another transition between those two states. And now, if I open that transition, I'm not dealing with a rate. I'm now dealing with just a straightforward prob probability and I might say that probability is 99%. So the probability of me detecting a failure is 
0.99. So that means the 1% chance I might not detect that problem. So it's an imperfect test. So I click OK, and that transition is there. I can move between the phases just to see what transitions are present. Now I can run an analysis of that Markov model, and I can get the results of that analysis. But what we're really interested in now is how we can share that with a fault tree. And it's actually very simple. I can just go back to fault tree. And using one of my existing events, or maybe I can create a, a new one. Let's call it Markov. Um, I can just grab my Markov model and drop that onto the event. So now that basic event is using the results of the Markov model as its input data. So that's allowing me to take account of more complicated behavior, stuff that wouldn't be modeled in a fault tree. I can model it in a Markov and then just feed that result back in uh, as part of my wider Markov analysis. That's an overview. I said one other thing worth mentioning as well before I carry on. Um, just like fault tree, you have the grid view where you can look at your Markov states and things like that. And you have plots where you can see the time dependent information for the model as well. Um, maybe in this example, I might increase the lifetime a little bit. Um, maybe we'll make that say one month just in hours. And um, oh, I need to update my Marco model. Run that again. So you see, we get slightly different behaviour. Uh, I might need more, uh, more. What's the word? More intervals to model that accurately. But you get the idea. You can get more com complex, more, um, yeah, more um, <laughs> detailed time-dependent information from a Markov analysis. So there you go. You can see that kind of dormancy behavior in the results there. Something you wouldn't be able to see in a regular fault tree. OK, so that's fault tree and Markov. Um, now, I'd also like to show you some of the import and export and reporting tools. Um, but before I move on to those, uh, do you have any, any questions about the things we've seen so far? Mm, not yet. No any question. OK. Um, well, maybe we'll take a look at the report tool first. Um, reporting, you can access by the report button just above the diagram. Um, the report designer, as we call it, is integrated into the program. And what it allows you to do is open report template files, which will then populate with data from your current project. Uh, you can then publish those reports in Word or PDF, or you can print them and so on. And all of the uh, report templates are customizable. And you can also create your own templates as well. Uh, so all of these reports can be customized in almost any way you want. But of course, we also provide a, a library of standard report templates with the software just to get you started. So I'll show you some of those. If I open reports and I'll go to the fault tree and event tree report folder. And we might start by taking a look at the cut sets for your, for your gates. So open. And so that's showing me the cut sets for the cooling gate. I can see all of those there just in the form of a simple table. Uh, I could also maybe go into the plots and maybe show the uh, importance data. It's a nice bar chart. The program will ask me to choose a gate I want to do that for. I'm going to choose my top gate again. And you might remember that plot from earlier on. That was the plot we saw uh, for the Fools of Vaselli importance, just in the form of a report this time. And of course, there were also diagram reports that let you view 
uh, your fault trees and I'll, I'll show all diagrams. So this will give me a report that shows me all of my fault tree uh, pages. I should also get my Markov model as well as part of that report. Um, so this one seems to have a blank front page. I don't know if somebody's edited that one, maybe. But um, <clears throat> all of these reports, as I mentioned, you can print them off. You can publish in Microsoft Word, publish in PDF. And for the text reports, you can publish in a text file formats as well, including CSV, which, of course, you could export to uh, Excel. As I mentioned, all these reports are customizable. If you want to get the report um, properties, you can do so just by clicking on design mode. And uh, in here, you can edit simple things like the headers and footers, column headings, and adding column uh, sort and filter. So there, for example, we're sorting the cut sets in ascending order of number. All of that can be customized. You can even add your own text boxes containing customized text or macros. So this macro, for example, shows the uh, date. You can have macros that show page numbers and so on. Yeah. Uh, the data itself is coming from the query. And there are two types of query you can use. There is the standard query and a custom query. The standard query is very simple. You just choose standard query, choose the data you want to show. So here we've chosen gate cut sets. And then you check the box next to the column you want to display. The custom query is a bit more advanced. Here you can write your own customized SQL query. And basically that allows you to combine the data from two or more different tables together. Again, you can filter and sort, and you can also perform other operations. So if you wanted to do an extra calculation, for example, that could be done with a custom query. So basically it's allowing you to create your own, your own highly customized report table, and then you can display columns from that table in the report. Um, so you can then save that template and reuse it with any projects that you might want. There's even a facility called the report folder, which allows you to uh, take two or more reports and then publish them in a single document. So you might want to take these three reports, for example, and put them all in a single PDF. The report, report folder would allow you to do that. So there's lots of uh, very useful customization tools for reporting. But again, we provide you with lots of standard reports just to kind of get you started uh, with reporting. Uh, so those are the reporting tools. Uh, do you have any, any questions on those at all? No. No, they were. Okay. So... Yeah. Um, the last thing then that I will show you <clears throat> are the import and export tools. Um, if you have a lot of, let's say, failure rate or MTTF data in something like Excel, um, you, you naturally you may not wish to enter all that data into the software by hand. That can be time consuming and maybe a little bit error prone. Uh, there, is, there are tools in the software for pulling data in from other formats and exporting to those formats as well. So let's take a look in the file menu. If I go to export to begin with, um, you can see here all the formats of data I can export to. I might export to Excel. And I can say export with no matches, which means that I'm going to be creating a brand new Excel file. Uh, I can, if I wish, export to an existing file and just append the data to it. But I don't have a file. I'm going to create a brand new one. And the column names will be in the first row of each worksheet. I'll choose a location to save that. Hmm. 
and open. So there's my new file. And now I just choose the data I want to export. I'm, I'm just going to export the data that's used to build the structure of the fault tree. So I'm going to take um, the gate table. I'll choose the table of data that contains the gate information. I'll take uh, primary events. And I will take the gate inputs. So these three tables are what give me the whole fault tree structure. And then from those tables, I can choose the columns that I want. So I can choose individual columns if I want to, or I can just take everything. So I might do that for each of those tables and then export. So I'll close the dialog and the program will ask me if I want to save my settings. That will create a template file so if I ever need to perform the same action again, I can just retrieve those settings from the template and I don't have to go and select all the tables and the columns again. Um, I'll just click no and we'll just take a quick look at the file we just created. So there's my gate table in one worksheet with all the gates and their data, primary events, and gate input. So all of that's been exported to Excel. So now I'll clear that. I'll go to File, Import. I'm importing from Excel. The column names are in the first row of the file. And now I'll just go and get that project, which is there. So I've successfully connected to the file. And there is just the preview of what's in that Excel file. So now I need to tell the program where this data is going to go. And there are a couple of ways to approach that. One, I can just select a table, and then select the corresponding table in the software, and that will create a link between them. Uh, but I actually exported the data from the software to begin with, so the names, as you can see, are all the same. So I can just do an auto match and that will automatically match up tables that have the same name. I can do that with the columns as well. So let's do that quickly. And then import. Again, when I close the dialog, the program asks me if I want to save a template. Again, I'll click no this time. <clears throat> and as you can see, the program has just reconstructed the fault tree from the contents of that Excel file. And you can import pretty much everything from a file, from an Excel file. So if you wanted to import failure rate data as generic failure models, you can do that. If you wanted to say, import uh, common cause failures or Markov models or uh, failure data for a viable analysis, all of that can be done with the import and export. The only thing you can't import are project results because of course you could import results that were incorrect for the file, but um, otherwise everything can be imported from Excel or Access or any of the formats that we saw there. But, no but this, uh, yes. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, David, uh, my question is that but the, uh, for importing the Excel file should be in the same structure as you have, yes? Because if I have, for example, in my, for my plant, uh, the Excel file list of my devices with probability of failure on demands, it should have, uh, it should arrange it like uh, the same structure as you have for importing uh, correctly. Um, yes, the, the structure we have is very simple. Um, what, I would, yeah. what, what I would suggest is, let, let's say um, you've got uh, certain failure models, so I'll, I'll just put um, I'll call that a sample, and you've got uh, components that have a probability of failure on demand listed with them, and you want to import that data. The correct yeah. format for that data is the fixed model type, and then you just enter an unavailability. So let, let me um, export that so you can see what it might look like. So what you would need is we export to Excel. Um, and I'll open. So we'll need 
uh, the failure models. And probably all you really need is the ID, uh, the model type, which is around here somewhere. There it is. And then the relevant parameters, which in this case is just the unavailability. Uh, so I'll take that. Export. So basically what the, the, the format your file would follow is would look something like this. <clears throat> and um, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily even need to have the same names here. So if you had say that was a uh, name and that was just type and you put that you call that say PFD. Whoops. So PFD and that would be fine as well. So you, you probably already have this and this in your Excel file. The only thing you need to add is this part here so the program knows what model type to use. Um, so if I save that, and then, so let's say we've got a new project and we need to import this data. I go to Import, Excel, Column Names in First Row, there's my model sheet, and there's the list of the stuff that's in there. So I would link that to the failure models sheet. You, again, your, your sheet might be called something different, but you can just do a manual match like that. And then, again, auto match won't work because none of these match up. But I would say, well, name is ID, and PFD is just the unavailability which is down here, and type is the model type, which is uh, here somewhere, there it is. So those are matched up. I can import, <clears throat> and you, you might want to say, well, I might need to do this again. So when I close it, I'll say, yes, I do want to save those template, that information. Uh, I'll put model template. So there is my sample model. It's fixed and it's got the PFD already in there. And then if I were to say go in, so let's say I open my model, uh, I, I'll call that say sample two. That's fixed as well. And maybe this time it's a, a different number. I'll save that. So I can just now go to file, import, and the program has found that that template automatically. It just automatically opened the last template. So I don't need to do anything now. I just click import. And you can see sample two is now there as well. Yes. Um, so yeah, so that's so that's the way I, I, I would think that the, the format of your failure data in your Excel file is already okay. The only thing you would probably need to add is that one column that tells the program what model type it is. So if you're using yeah. probability of failure on demand, you'd use fixed. If, say, you have repair and failure rates, you'd use the rate model. So it's just a matter of making sure you've got the right type selected. So do you have any other questions at all? No, I I don't have. All you have? No. No, I don't have. All is clear. Okay. You, well. Um, yeah. So I've be obviously been recording the demo, so I can make that available as a, a download for you later on. Um, but if you do have any more questions in the future, uh, please feel free to get in contact with us. Um, so I guess Rachel was your original point of contact. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you have any questions about licenses or about prices, uh, Rachel can yeah, yeah. help you with that. If you ha have any questions about uh, the technical stuff, about uh, functionality and things like that, you can contact me. Right. Yeah, got it. Okay. So thank you very much for joining me today. And um, again, I'll send you a link for the, for the uh, video later on. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll bring the meeting to a close, and uh, please have a good day. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank thanks a lot. Much. Thanks a lot for explaining everything. Thanks. Thanks no a lot. Okay. Yeah, no we'll problem.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.